It's finally quiet. <laughs> Quieter. Okay. Hi, my name is Arlene, and I'd like to welcome you to what is going to be, I know, an outstanding presentation. Annalise Lastbaum is going to tell you her story. She has pictures to show you. She has relics to show you, and she's got an incredible story, and you will probably relate to a lot of it because these things happened to Annalise when she was a very young woman, very young. I'm going to let her tell you her story now, and uh, I'll take questions a little bit later. Okay. Thank you very much, Emily. It is really a pleasure to be here and have, see all of you take the interest in the Holocaust. I'm very pleased, seriously, especially as a survivor. Thank you very, very much. So what I'm about to share with you is my life under the Nazi rule, which was written in response to a request by a documentation center in Bonn, Germany, the city I grew up in. I call it growing up under trying conditions. They asked that I write about my childhood in Bonn, including friends, neighbors, schools, or anything else that I care to mention, any kind of experience. You know, it is very difficult to write about the many things that happened over the years, but it certain happenings had an impact on my life and a disease that I wrote about. Smaller things than Auschwitz had to offer in addition to the Auschwitz experience, but they were extremely important for they either shaped me or they just pulled me apart. So I want to give you background, my life as a child. I was born 1929. I lived in Bonn, as I mentioned, and it is such a beautiful town, seriously. I loved the area. I lived two blocks away from the marketplace, the city hall. I could go to the stores. I had to walk through the park. I lived opposite the university. A wonderful, wonderful place. So I could walk to everything, and I, my parents were not afraid to let me go, even at a very early age at the time, except for the fact that, of course, I was Jewish. I grew up in a Nazi environment. I never knew anything else. You know, I went to the marketplace. Why? Because I loved the parades. I loved the music that they had. I loved the many colors. There was a lot of excitement, but still, I, the Jewish child, could not belong. I could only observe and had an underlying fear from which there really was no escape. But I still went. All right. And then I loved going to the stores until signs appeared, no Jews allowed. So that took care of my going to the stores. All right. Beginning um, of um, November 1938, very, very early on, I was still able to see my, my movie. I loved movies. There was no television, right? And uh, it felt very safe. Uh, it was wonderful to sit in the dark and then concentrate on a story. So that was my entertainment primarily telling you about my home life. My father was a teacher and later one principal of the Jewish school, and he was a cantor of the synagogue. That's the one who does most of the singing and the playing. So I was his daughter. And you know something? When you're the daughter of a teacher, you really have to try a little bit harder. It gets a lot more difficult at times. But being the daughter of a cantor is something else, because I would walk into the synagogue, and I'm the only kid, and the whole congregation, of course, is very nice to the kid of the cantor. So was I spoiled? Very much so. Did I feel at home? Absolutely. It was my second home. I was also religious. 
So it was uh, something that, where, that I always felt when I was there, I was with somebody of respect, of influence, I enjoyed seeing my father on the altar, not really always understand what he was saying in his sermons, but that doesn't matter. I love the music. <coughs> my mother was also part of the music, and uh, she was in the choir, and she had a solo singing by herself, meaning, quote, in my distress, I cried to the Lord. <coughs> he answered me by setting me free. The Lord is with me. I shall not fear. What could a man do to me? Unquote. We found out what a man can do. So just understand, I grew up in that synagogue. I, it, it was the most comfortable thing next to being home. So when the Pokemon came, the Kristallnacht, November 10th, 1938, someone rushed into our school and shouted that our synagogue, my synagogue, my home was now on fire. How can I describe the feeling of helplessness, sadness, as I walked along my father's side, he's walking his bicycle, keeping me company, neither one of us saying anything until we get home. There, of course, was also the day when the roundup was of the Jewish males, stores were demolished when all that glass was broken. And the, so many, so many bad things happened <coughs> that, but, but <coughs> that particular day. So, we also had a phone call during the night previous. And my aunt, uncle, who lived nearby, um, they, <coughs> excuse me, they um, had already experienced what was happening. In some places it happened on the nights. And uh, they said, we have to come and visit you right away. What had happened to them? A group of people had come, took my uncle out, threw him into a well, and if it wouldn't been for a local policeman who pulled him out, he could have drowned. So I'd like to explain this a little bit because this can be questioned. Who carried out these destructive deeds that particular day? Were they local people? Sure, some of them joined the organized groups who were sent on a mission of destruction. However, we found out later on that these groups were not always the locals. The locals could have been somebody, somebody's neighbor, somebody's friend, somebody who bought in a Jewish bakery, somebody's schoolmate. So that didn't work too well. Hence, the locals were sent to another city where they became part of the group where they were not emotionally involved, what they were doing with all that demolition, but through their participation, proved their faithful loyalty to the party. And that's how it started. Well, the Holocaust was the day, I have to tell you, when things began for real for me. The Holocaust was the day when everything cultural came to an end. No more movie. Um, where many bad things happened thereafter, and I will go into some of them. And uh, I wasn't really the same person that I was on November 8th or 9th. I had changed, and I was not quite 10 years old at the time. So that was it. So I want to come to something that happened in Germany. Um, newspapers, you know, when you go to Europe Monday, I'm sure you will, you will see all these uh, papers displayed 
displaced in a case. And it's about you walk over there and it's free of charge and you can stand there all day, read a paper and never pay for one. Perfect. Yeah, well, but our street also had a paper. It was called Der Stürmer, meaning the attacker, meaning us. We are the attacker. It was a Nazi anti-Semitic racial propaganda publication. I would just look at it, the headlines, cartoons in passing, for it gave me a sense of ill boding. The stories and characters depicted and presented as truth for everyone to see and read about. This is what they wanted. These characters were my people. These were nobody that I could identify. It was a lie and I was confused. I got confused so often during those days, I can't tell you. Now, I have to go to school. And in order to get to the school, Jewish school, I never went to public school, I might add right here, I wasn't allowed to go. Uh, I had to go through a park. And that was really a very wonderful thing because I was in touch with nature, but more important, I personally did not look like the characters they had on the newspapers. Uh, I was tall, blonde, had blue eyes. I looked more like the regular population. And so people would ne didn't come up to me and mistake me for Jewish, so, which happened to other people. My mother once, who looked the same as I did, was standing with a person in the street and in conversation when someone approached her with the admonition, aren't you ashamed to be seen with this Jew? Well, uh, I must tell you, if anyone would come to us, push us, spit at us, did anything what they wanted to us, we did not have the protection of the police. Those rights had been taken away from us in 1935. We were stateless. So anybody really wants to push me off the sidewalk? Too bad. Or wants to do anything worse on me? Too bad. There was nothing I could do about it. I could go to pl explain to my parents, but that didn't do any good. So that was it. So I was able to escape, as I mentioned, but not for very long because they devised something else. We had to be identified, and we had to wear a Judenstern, a Jewish six-pointer star of David, with the German word Jew on it. Now, I can... I can tell you <coughs> that wearing this Judenstern forced me to walk with my side downward, my head bowed. I did not want to see the reaction of other people. It gave me a feeling of fear to draw attention, a feeling of rejection. It totally isolated me from them. Isolation became an absolute necessity when facing the SS guards in the beginning. Later on, however, starting with Auschwitz, I learned to reverse this process. As time circumstances changed our contact with the SS became a constant, I began to look at their faces because I often wondered, did they ever have a mother? Did they have a child? Did they even have a dog? Oh yeah, they had dogs, all right. I knew that actually, but I figured a nice little pet at home. Um, did they show any kind of kindness, any kind of human behavior? We didn't see it. We couldn't person. I saw mostly their faces stern, <coughs> and it was danger to me in the expression. It became extremely important to stay one step ahead in awareness, alertness, and try to anticipate any upcoming situation and quickly prepare myself to emotionally to the conditions that might be coming up. 
So, in July 41, and just for a year, July 41, we were forced to give up our apartment in Bonn, and then we had to live in isolation in a convent for one year. Myself was a convent for a year. Uh, I must tell you, in the place where had been 110 nuns who were told right after lunch that stuff was still in the dining room when we got there on the table, get your personal belongings, there are two buses waiting for you and you'll be in place in other convents, that's it, period, out. Some of the farmers came and helped them put their stuff together. They were thrown out of their place. And uh, incidentally, which had nothing to do with this, uh, they were never able to come back until the end of the war because after we were forced out there, the SS took over as the headquarters. So they lost their home for the whole war. Now, I had been back to Germany several times after. And I saw the walls and of the garden, and they're really not very high at all. And it seemed incredible to me afterwards. Uh, we could have escaped very easily because they weren't high. But we were two. Who would have helped us? In 1941, the cloister became my prison. 474 people were interned. Seven people survived. I am one of the seven. Seven people survived who were only women. Gentlemen among you, if you would have been my schoolmate at the time, you would not be standing next to me telling your story because none of the boys, none of the men returned to Bonn. My day was taken up in the beginning with school. My father was still allowed to give lessons. But then it didn't last very long. Jewish children now were forbidden to learn. And I tell you, it was a bad day. We stood around the piano and we cried instead of singing. I was 12 years old, and this is now the end of my education. That might be, sound like a little fun not to go to school, but trust me, no. They thought that I would be capable, Jewish children wouldn't be capable. They shouldn't be capable. They didn't want them to learn anymore. It was, it was over for us. And that meant reality was then that I never went to school after 12 and never returned to a real classroom until I was liberated in New York and then attended an evening high school to at least get a general diploma that was the best I could do under the circumstances. I never wrote anything. My handwriting, I saw this after the war when I tried to write something. My handwriting after I was liberated and I was already 16 and so on, it was like a 12 year old. Because I never, I never wrote anything on paper during the whole time. And that was it. Imagine that. So anyway, uh, I must tell you a few years earlier, before we got into the, into the cloister, I had a little kitten. Unfortunately, she got stepped on by accident. And this had been my first introduction to death of something or someone close to me. It was bad. I did not want to repeat the ache of losing something dear, so I didn't want to play with a new kitten and didn't want a new one, but, the, but our lawyer who had been there with us, he had one. So I went upstairs and I would sort of play with him, and it felt so wonderful to stroke a warm, playful thing. That was my enjoyment at the convent. And I think you who have pets will know what I'm talking about. The enjoyment came to an end. We were the last one to leave went to an unknown test destination, but it turned out to be Theresienstadt, uh, and uh, that's, it's called Theresienstadt today. 
So Theresa Stadter was there from July 42 to very early uh, October 44. Uh, in contrast to what you might hear about Theresa Stadt in the very, very beginning when we got the, there in 42, it, it was not an easy time at all. We slept on the floor. It, it, it was just horrible. I don't have enough time to go into describing that. But it wasn't what it was later on for, for reasons that I will come to. <coughs> uh, things started to improve for our family as youth homes opened up, and that, of course, was very good for me. And uh, this, I was there for about two years. Uh, I shared a small roof with 13 girls, five of whom survived. So um, we sort of formed the group at the time because we were trying to learn from each other. Uh, we didn't know what the future was hold. We didn't know. But whatever we had learned up till that point, you know, what can we do? But toward this goal of learning a little bit more and sharing some sort and all of that, uh, the adults helped us as much as they could in Theresienstadt. Uh, if, you, if there was a, let's say that there was a history teacher someplace, he would come and volunteer, give us a lesson. A lesson only. Nothing was written down. There was no exam. None of that stuff. They would sit there like you're sitting down without papers and listen to what the person had to say. But this was an interesting thing and a very important thing because it kept our moral up and, uh, you know, it gave us a feeling that, yeah, somebody is really trying to help us. Very, very important. Now, my parents were in the same place because uh, my father became a leader of a boys' room and was in charge of all religious services for the whole time that we were there. And I never, never, never missed his service. I missed it once. I will come to that later. Um, so this learning process was very important to us, uh, and it was done after work because during the day we had our assignment was that we had to be working in uh, the gardens that were on top of the fortresses. If you ever see a picture of Theresienstadt, and you know vegetables and stuff like that. My my mother was uh, working in the laundry room of the building. Um, one of the other nice things that happened while I was there is that they, my parents were together up on, you know, under the roof um, with another couple and, um, from Bonn, and uh, he was working in the kitchen. Yeah, you got to get lucky. So that was my second lucky strike. So every once in a while, he would bring home a little bit of extra food, so I would go upstairs and have a little something extra. So I didn't feel too good about it, because the others did get it in the room. But I went upstairs, my parents insisted. And so that was extremely, was extremely helpful for me, because I, did, I was sick. I had jaundice, pleurisy, and a touch of tuberculosis during that time. So it was important to my parents to keep my health up. Now, came June 23, 1944, and this is the day you will read about in every book that has ever been written, and, and plenty has been written about that book. Why? <coughs> the, ins the inspection took place by the International Red course. Yep. And let me tell you something, there had to be preparations made, and I always feel if Hollywood would have given them some Oscars, a dozen would have been enough. They did such a good job as a place. They turned it into a model ghetto. Now we had culture, we had music, uh, they opened up stores, they issued money, I have copies of this here. You, you can maybe see it later if, if you have time. Uh, the, <laughs> the, the money has Moses and the Ten Commandments on it, which is really somebody who ever invented that must have had a sense of humor. Who were the murderers? 
Ten Commandments. So, right. My parents became involved in the cause because the, the opera Carmen was given. And for them, it meant a little bit of extra food rationing. It also meant that, uh, you know, after all, they were back into music, which was so important in their lives for this very brief period of time. And okay, I never actually saw the performance, but let me tell you something. After liberation, I did not listen to Carmen. I could not listen to Carmen. It upset me so much because of what happened afterwards. So the people came, the Red Cross came. They allowed themselves to be led like a bunch of sheep by the SS guards, never going off the rosy path to see the old people in the barracks under their true conditions. And the Red Cross should carry a mark of shame forever for this negligence, for they inspected this model camp as an example of all concentration camps. They should have been in Auschwitz that day. So what happened? After these gentlemen left, so did we to Auschwitz. We were no longer needed as showpieces. In all fairness to the Red Cross, I have to say that on their 50th anniversary, they regretted what they call impossible omission and error of the past. More fail, institutions, more failure with regard to the Holocaust. This was what they said. Unfortunately, in 07, when there was a problem in Darfur, which you might learn about maybe, is Darfur, the Red Cross would not testify on Darfur. Well, why not? Because the group had a long-standing pledge of neutrality, the president said yesterday, yeah, why? because he, the ICRC admitted of moral failure in keeping silent about the Nazi genocide of Jews during World War II. So they had already made a mistake, had already apologized for it, and then never helped out in Darfur. Great. They're doing better today, I hope. So anyway, time one more thing. What was the purpose of the way it all altogether? Yes, they had anticipated that there might be an inspection from the world outside. And that's why so many of the people, of the artists and so on and so forth, and special people had been sent to the Asian and others to the other camps. However, World War I veterans were also sent there, by the way. So, but was it really was? It was falsehood and death. Ruth Kluger described the Asian as, quote, the stable that supplied the slaughterhouse. My friends, the stable supplied 87,000 people to the slaughterhouse. There were transports going constantly. We were always afraid that we would receive a pink slip, and meaning people would be sent away. And it happened all the time. It just didn't know when would be our turn. Well, our turn came at that point. Um, so it was my family's ending. That's, it was the day of September 27th, 1944. Uh, it was a day of atonement, our holiest day of the year. And I must tell you, the one time I did not attend my father's service because the pain of losing my father the next day was too much for me to sit and listen to his la last, last service. And it was such an important one. So I went someplace else. I didn't enjoy it, I guarantee you. I was afraid 
when that evening would come, but it came. I had to go upstairs now, no food now. What I had to do now was a private farewell. No <coughs> emotions will be shown to the Germans. We're proud and we are strong. Keep that in mind. So I bowed my head. I felt my father's gentle touch for the very last blessing. He used to bless me every Friday night. I was used to that for better reasons. He was 44. My mother was 41. The next morning, wheels of his train started off slowly toward eternity. We had volunteered to follow him, but they would have picked us up anyway. That was not the point. A week later, our wheels arrived slowly at Auschwitz, Birkenau. He was there, I found out afterwards. Only we were never to see him again. Right there, our thoughts were intertwined for all of our days. He died three months later in the satellite camp of Dachau. My mother died after liberation as a result of very severe tuberculosis. So now we are on our way to Auschwitz. My mother, my aunt, myself. And of course, we didn't know where we were going, right? So we ended up in the Birkenau place. Do you know what the scene was like? You might have seen it in a movie, I'm not sure. So everyone had to leave all of their belongings on the train to step outside the formal line. But now came the selection, which, by which the individual were told to go either to the right or to the left by an SS guard. Since all the other children were going to the left, it was only natural that I wished to join them because in Theresienstadt, the children were treated a little bit better. And that's where I wanted to go. I wanted to get the better deal on this. Nope. The SS guards added, to, he asked for my age. And I replied that I was 14. I lied. I was 15. But maybe because I was tall, blonde, blue eyes, that came in handy. He sent me to the right with my mother. The women went into a room, were told to undress in front of the guards. Another room, my hair was shaved off. And then we took a shower. We were giving some summer clothes to wear, which, result, which was really nothing but a dress and shoes. And then that was it. Many things started. But here's my observation of this. Very few people can pinpoint the moment when they cease to be a child and become a young adult. It is and it should be a very gradual transition. And you know about this. It is this moment in my life that the arrival at Auschwitz, the silent inwardly screaming goodbye to my favorite 29 year old aunt who was gassed because she was limping, but who also had been a teacher for children. She was engaged to be married. She would have been a wonderful citizen, no. The people who sat there only saw she was limping and pointed a thumb. That was all, death. So I had to witness the same thing between my friend and her mother. And then the undressing and shaving on all parts of my body in front of sneering of the SS guards. And then seeing my mother bald in rags and terrified. This was the moment of my initiation into maturity. I was never a child again. It was over. Now, women had no personal items for the next seven months or so. And the best way that I can explain this is that for the next seven months, I did not brush my teeth 
because I had no toothbrush or toothpaste. So if you don't get <laughs> anything like that, which is so basic in your life, imagine all the other things that were missing. Right. Oh, of course, they would be locked up inside bags. And uh, unfortunately, we had to listen to the screaming that went out, went on outside the barracks because people were shot right there. And to us, it, we were just petrified because we didn't think what was coming next. Would they open that door and s step out? Oh, what a horrible time that was. But the following day, we were sent off in these cattle cars, as you had seen, and we were sent to an airplane factory in Freiburg, Saxon. Now, that seemed like a contrast to Auschwitz because now I slept in a heated factory building. And before we had left Auschwitz, because we were going for labor, uh, they had given us a little bit more clothing. Uh, we, I had a coat now to wear and uh, some underwear now and, you know, one, one outfit, okay? So, right. Um, we also slept on regular bunks now uh, and only two people on a bunk, unless Auschwitz, which had God knows so many. Uh, but this time we also received a pillow and a blanket, which I did not have in Auschwitz. I slept on wood only. That was it. So, uh, but while we were there, and there were 500 women who worked 10 hours a day, seven days a week. We had a half an hour for lunch, but that was a little bit of a problem. No, it wasn't little, it was big. We had to pick up our lunch, eat our lunch, have toilet privileges. Half an hour, back to work. Toilet privileges were not extended during working hours. Yep, one day I couldn't do it. I went to the bathroom afterwards. And I came out. <laughs> Guess who greeted me? SS, a woman. She wanted to know what I was doing, really. There were a number of women at that point who took care of us. And let me tell you something, ladies, you weren't any better than the men. You were just as nasty as the men. No difference at all. So, it didn't end up that well for me either, but so be it. Now, even things we were free and standing for line, it, except for standing in line to be counted, that was always the case. Um, now, the women were able to take a brief weekly shower with soap. Okay, but, but if ever I talk about shower now, and I will again, we never had a towel to dry up with, keep that in mind. Uh, washing facility any other day were on the outside, and it was a pretty cold winter that year, uh, so we didn't wash our whole body, we just water and face done because we were afraid we would get sick. That was it. Um, end of the year, there was a very heavy bombing <coughs> in Dresden. Uh, it's still on the books. And, uh, so what happened? We were, seated, we were sent to unheated barracks. Uh, that was a little bit on the cold side, but only for a very short time, because what happened? The factory was bombed. We had no work from here on in. Well, my friends, you might think that sounds terrific. It was only a brief period, but it really allows a lot of time for thinking. And under the circumstances, that can be almost dangerous. There was too much to think about. Right, at this point, let me, uh, allow me to recap some of the things that spent over the years. I'm talking about packing. All of you go away at one point or another. You take your, in the summer, you take whatever you need to go swimming, etc., etc. Come home, everything is in place, everything is wonderful, life goes on for you. That's not the kind of packing that I'm talking about. When we had to pack, that meant we never return. We had to pack for all seasons. But there was a limit to what we can pack. 
there were restrictions. So that meant, uh, depending where we would move to, from the convent, we, uh, to the convent, we were able to take some furniture because my father had an office and so on and so forth. Go to Theresienstadt, no more furniture, that was all taken. You had to wear things uh, on the way because the more you could put on on yourself, the more you had with you. Uh, let's say it was July, you put on two extra sweaters, stuff like that. And uh, also then, what are you taking? You have to take your bedding, you have to take some cooking utensils, you have to take medicine, and, so, and some of the clothing for, for all seasons. But then, you ha might have a child, that, can ca that kid can carry very much, or you have elderly parents, they can't carry very much. It was a very difficult, difficult time. And when you look at the pictures, and you can see them, that people go like this. And, you know, and the SS on the side, and they have a few dogs to keep your company on barking like crazy, uh, which intimidates everybody, and especially the children. Uh, it was difficult. And, of course, for the gods, we never walked fast enough. As simple as all that. But then we leave Theresienstadt, and now we've gone to, unknown to us to Auschwitz, where nothing, nothing, nothing came out of the, the train, except for, two, for one thing. But I had taken two things, actually. One of them was my report card, believe it or not. Even though I had a lousy mark in math, and I never, it never improved. Um, but um, to me, it was an old piece of paper that showed me that at one point, Somebody thought I was actually capable of learning something on different subjects, and I could develop, and it would be fine. I would be functioning eventually, and that's why I wanted my old report card. Unfortunately, it stayed in Auschwitz. But the other thing was, which was much more important, since my father had left a few days before we did, I was in the possession of a tiny picture uh, so what I did, I cut out his head, and I took that tiny thing with me, as large as my fingernail. Uh, <coughs> when it came time to out, 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 rouse, uh, that's what I grabbed, the only thing that I could grab. And so what happened? Um, I was very proud that I had it, but unfortunately, uh, every time I had to stand capel, standing, you know, to be counted, uh, I had to put it in my mouth because God knows I was afraid to be caught with that. However, I wouldn't, wouldn't even think about that, so I put it in my mouth. So you can imagine, back and forth, it went back with mouth. Well, I hate to tell you this, and it, it only lasted for a very short time, and I cried bitterly when his face faded away and all that was left was a piece of paper. Uh, I might as well add that that was the only time during the whole seven months that I allowed myself to cry. Crying was a kind of emotion that took strength and uh, we didn't have the kind of strength to waste. The only other time that I cried, which was appropriate, but we were liberated. Different story. So, now, what did I carry when I boarded the train to Mauthausen, uh, the a concentration camp in Austria? So, uh, while we were at the airplane factory, um, vanity set in my ladies because our hair started to grow back. <clears throat> it came from nothing to a little bit, and you know, after four months or so, it's already like this. So, always somebody around who is enterprising, trust me. And since we were working in an airplane factory and we had material there, scraps of material, this lady made a comb which was very nice. As a matter of fact, she tried to make it a little bit fancy and even put an indentation in here. So, one piece of bread, this is a payment. That meant that day, 
I didn't have a piece of bread to eat. But it was important for us to have our hair somehow. We weren't clean, but that's a different story. The other thing was they had given us a piece of soap, but as I had mentioned. Why? Because first of all, we looked aside, no hair. That wasn't the kind of thing you saw at the time otherwise. But the clothing that had been issued to us was for the next seven months until the liberation, and then they weren't washed either. They were never washed. We had no opportunity to change clothing. We had nothing else to go into. Can, do I have to tell you how we smelled? Well, the Germans finally got the, got, the, got the drift on that one. And so they decided, well, we're going to issue you a piece of soap. That was, and, and give us a shower instead of going outside all the time in the cold, where we couldn't do anything. So yes, Sundays we had a thing. Now remember, we also have no towel, right? So another, in, another person, ha, 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 ha. This is much more important what she invented there. A soapbox. Yep. You should see how this is put together with the scrap. Thing. This is a cover for it. I really want you to come up later and take a good look at this. It fits, trust me. The soap's still in it. I never took it out. So my friends, let me tell you something. I carried these two items only. I bought nothing else from Europe when I came over here. These two items to America to make it visible today because these two items are my two witnesses to the Holocaust. They were brought into being out of necessity. They represented truth of policy and conditions that prevailed under a totalitarian regime. And we, the survivors, will defy anyone who tells us or our people that the Holocaust is a hoax and did not happen. The Holocaust happened. You are looking at the truth. You can come up and touch it. I am sitting here and the truth. Anyone telling you anything different, please tell them they are making a mistake. You have seen the truth. They should stop telling the Holocaust did not happen. So, this is one thing. The other thing I just want to tell you that I had a birthday like everybody else, all right? No, come on, it was a, it's a good time to have a birthday. So yeah, and uh, at home, while I was still at home, uh, my parents always waited until they thought I was asleep. Well, that never happened, you know that. And um, they would come tiptoe into my room and, and then spread out some of the goodies on the table next to me, and I was so happy. Oh, I might need a little more. And I, need, I was really very happy because, uh, you know, what would be the best present of them all? What was the best present? My 16th birthday in, there at the factory. My mother had done something. She swung a deal. Days before my birthday, she would rotate her daily ration of bread, give it to a person, some, so she wouldn't eat it, safekeeping it. Morning of my birthday, she handed this, took a little piece herself, gave another piece to my friend, etc., etc. With this bread, my mother had given me a gift that changed my character. She did not just still my physical hunger of the moment. She gave me love and she showed me how this can be through perseverance and sacrifice. So I never forget that particular birthday. Why am I telling you this? That I was hungry? Mm -mm. I'm telling you this because it is a life lesson. 
a more, more heroic conduct. For even under the most awful conditions, people maintained character and value. And she most certainly did. She was an example to me. So it is we're coming to the end of all of this. We are being liberated. Uh, on May 3rd, we're standing in line, too long, uh, and uh, they told us to go back. Later on, I found out after liberation that some, some of knowledgeable informed me that we were supposed to go into the gas chamber nearby in Gusen, which is uh, a satellite camp of Mauthausen. Uh, the only reason they didn't send us was this. They had run out on Cyclone B, which they needed to gas us. There wasn't enough there. We were not gassed that day. Two days before liberation. So, next day, there was a white flag. That's the day we started weeping. It was a lot to handle. Would we still be normal too? And then, for May 5th, the American soldiers arrived and they liberated us. So, I wish to thank the American soldiers who did it that day. And remember, 400,000 Americans died during World War II. I wish to thank the American people who sacrificed and helped us by sending these soldiers. We, should, we have to thank them today again. And I wish to thank the American government who later on opened the door for us so that we could live in a democracy. Now, I'm sure when you started off today, you must have been thinking, oh yeah, the survivor is going to talk to us and what's she going to tell us? Why is she, you know, what is this going to be after 75, 80 years? Why is she telling us a story? So, what can we learn? I tell you this because you have to learn from the Holocaust. And is it because I want you to do a few things for us. Try to understand other people. Try to be really tolerant. But be kind. Know right from wrong. And demand justice. That's what I ask of you. Follow this and you should feel very proud of yourself. You should be a role model to your family, your community, and you really would become wonderful citizens. So I encourage you to do this. And that's why I told you the story of the Holocaust, the evil of 80 years ago. Don't let it be repeated. It's up to you. And I Thank you all for being such a wonderful audience to listen. You want the mic? No, that's okay. I can shout. <laughs> I want to thank you all for being here. Uh, if anybody wants to come up and look yeah. at these things before you have to leave, I know you have to leave very quickly, so things are up here. I'm going to call a table at a time. If you'd like to come up, please do, and then meet your teacher at the front over here, and you'll be able to get ready to go down for lunch. So, may I ask this table to start us off? Uh, one more thing. I have one picture here which looks like a little cottage in some place or another. What it actually is, it was a, a distracted gas chamber of Auschwitz. They had four of those. Those things were going constantly. They were killing 1,000 people within a 24-hour period. Four of those. But this is what it looks like today. I took, my daughter took this picture four years ago. Picture of Annalise, her boyfriend at the time, and her sister.